Thank you. Um, this has really been a terrific presentation so far, and I have to say that I've been jotting down lots of great ideas to learn from this. Um, my lab for many years is, is, has been both challenged by and, and interested in the, the, how we measure antigenic diversity, both on a, a B cell level and on a, a T cell level, and trying to develop sort of more proteome-wide ways to do immune monitoring um, and to understand everything from, from what drives, uh, w what are the structural components really that, that help drive uh, immunogenicity. And so what I, I'll, this is just some of my disclosures, none of which are really relevant uh, to this particular conversation. Um, we started really measuring antibody repertoires in part because technically and biochemically it's just simply much easier to do. Um, and the one of the things that we have learned in particular about cancer-specific antibody immunity is that antibodies obviously recognize alterations in, in protein and in, in glycoprotein, I would say, uh, structure um, and expression. Uh, they recognize obviously both linear and conformational changes. And that autoantibodies can be detected across the spectrum in, in both healthy individuals and in disease states. And we are starting to understand some of the biochemical properties by which um, antibodies are, are naturally generated. And that these may be biomarkers of risk and detection, prognosis and prediction um, for a variety of different disease states, including autoimmunity. What we've studied primarily is cancer and, and, and somewhat in infectious diseases and may be relevant um, in particular for our conversations about immunotherapies. I want to start in talking some about what we've learned about antibodies and then, and then we'll move over into peptide MHC TCR interactions. So the approach that we've taken to measure antibodies um, is to develop We've been working with custom protein microarrays that were developed originally by Josh LeBear's group when he was at the Harvard Institute of Proteomics here. He's now the, uh, the director of the Insti uh, Biodesign Institute at Arizona State um, and is a long-term collaborator of mine. And uh, what he and Nero Maramachandran uh, worked on while they were here at Harvard and then have since really just dramatically expanded the, the technology behind this, is using in vitro uh, transcription translation systems uh, to uh, express and then uh, locally capture uh, um, ORFs uh, expressed uh, using IVTT. And in particular, they use uh, human HeLa lysate right now for the expression of these systems. And so by doing this, you have an individual spots on, on arrays. Obviously, you have um, uh, full-length proteins with any individual tag uh, captured onto the arrays in, in an addressable format. And so what has really happened with these arrays over time, and you, you can probe these arrays with a variety of things. You can probe them with drugs. You can probe them with antibodies. You can probe them with plasma or serum and identify antibody responses, which is a lot of what I'm going to be presenting. But, but some of the advantages of these particular arrays, and I don't know if I can show this here yet, is that the the source cDNA then can be whatever you want. You can flip them in and out of different types of vector systems. And so you can leverage Orpheum collections using N or C terminal tags, using flag tags or halo tags for denatured antigens. You can use, um, you can use GST tags and a variety of different tag systems. And then the arrays themselves have actually evolved over time. And I won't show some of this data, much of which is published um, from linear planar arrays to uh, nanowell chambers using um, um, cover capture approaches. So then now we can fit about 10,000 individual nanowells on a given slide. Um, it improves the efficiency and, and the detection of antibodies in ways that, that we uh, before couldn't see. The protein expression systems and the IVTT systems um, have really dramatically also improved over time. Uh, we rely much on a thermal high bay, uh, based approach from HeLa lysates, but um, um, the advent of these technologies has really improved. We've gotten about 15-fold level increase in, in protein expression, and, and the reproducibility and the limited autoreactivity of the materials and the contents within the lysate has actually markedly improved the ability to detect antibodies using these approaches. And by doing this, then, you can also you can put on um, uh, mutagenomes, uh, orpheomes of, of a variety of different systems, although the antibodies, I will say, as we look at them from, like, we, we, we expressed 
52 different mutated P53s, for example, antibodies are not nearly as, as sensitive, I would say, to single nucleotide or single amino acid changes, at least um, in the context of P53. We've done this somewhat with PIK3CA and other commonly mutated antigens. And, and they really do need a little bit more, at least in, in, in our hands, for naturally occurring antigens uh, to have strong, to induce strong antibody responses. But that being said, you can rel readily probe with serum. And the advantage with this system is not only can we do it on planar arrays, we also do this in ELISA-based formats. We've adapted this to bead-based systems. And so you can rapidly screen for antibody responses to a variety of different antigens and neoantigens included. So um, one of the, the resources that we use routinely is DNASU, which is our local biorepository for Orpheum collection. Uh, we have stored well over 200,000 plasmids. They're all um, in uh, mostly in gateway donor vector systems, um, and they are available for uh, distribution to researchers uh, throughout the world um, at an at-cost system. And, and so this permits us, um, this is not just, our human collection is about 18,000 human ORFs right now, and then we have a variety of different pathogens as well, and an extensive uh, pathogen-specific immunity projects uh, that are ongoing um, in the center. And this is a little bit of the the automation uh, that is part of the uh, production of these protein microarrays. Now, one both advantage in, in, in of, of NAPA-based protein display, NAPA is the terminology that uh, Josh's group came up with for this particular type of protein arrays. And remember, these are not a priori purified, okay? These, they're, they're generated in, in situ. Um, and so as a result, that you, you can rapidly translate this for, for ELISA detection for any given antigen. Um, that you're interested in. Over 88% of the proteins actually will be expressed in situ, although there is one of the disadvantages. There's limited post-translational modifications. There's probably some very early glycosylation that happens with these, but, but other than that, there's not um, uh, the complex alterations in glycosylation. We have some uh, grants to look at this um, and develop more in situ-based um, post-translational modification systems. There is probably limited disulfide bond formation, so when we really try to look at, at cell surface structures, um, in particular, anything in the immunoglobulin superfamily is probably not um, maintaining um, expected uh, interchain or, or interchain disulfide bonds. So it's actually a little bit more challenging when it comes to structure-based uh, antibody measures on the surface. But but the majority of these will be expressed in situ, and there is a, a, a maintenance of the majority, is certainly of intracellular structural epitopes. Um, and so that protein-protein interactions are maintained and actually um, enzymatic activity, uh, for example, phosphatase-based um, enzymatic activity can be maintained on the array so that they can be used to, to be screening for uh, drug-specific interactions or, or, or inhibitor-specific interactions, which is one advantage. Um, we can denature the proteins on the arrays to look for uh, denatured specific uh, epitopes as well in terms of antibody responses. And this is a little bit of the automation in the system uh, we have right now for um, for generating these arrays and also for sort of for high throughput DNA production, which serves for the arrays. These are now fully robotically driven and what used to take a graduate student about six weeks to make the human Orpheum protein arrays now takes the robots about three days and they make a lot fewer mistakes, I will admit. Um, so, so this is a, a uh, an image of a uh, typical antigen array. This is actually a little bit of our older school version, uh, which has about 2,000 antigens on a given slide. Um, and when we're adding patient serum, what you end up with is, is strong antibody responses. And I, will, and I put a P53 up there for a reason. It remains in all of the screening studies we've done for naturally occurring antibodies, certainly within tumors, one of the most immunogenic proteins we've ever identified. And we know that when P53 mutates, um, it can enhance the stability of the molecule, and so you have relative, not, not overexpression at the RNA level, but you have uh, increased stability of, of P53, and so you have, uh, have enhanced P53 expression as measured by IHC. And, and it's interesting because the antibodies are primarily not driven to the mu mutated forms of the molecule. They're not actually driven to um, the mutations in the, within the molecule. They're actually in flanking residues primarily in the NNC termini, but it is highly immunogenic. You, if you look in, in women with ovarian cancer, they might titer out, have antibody titers about 1 to 50,000 or more. Um, if you look... Um, um, if you start to look at, at what are the rules of why some people make antibodies and why people don't, if you look at ovarian cancer, about f 
somewhere between 25 to 30 percent of patients will mount an antibody response to to mutations in p53 it doesn't there is some correlation with which p53 mutations will drive antibody responses but there certainly is a host based factors involved in whether this is related to fc gamma receptor mutations or you know polymorphisms or other types of host factors of why some people are mounting antibody responses and more prone to this rather than others i, I think it in general the field is 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 pretty wide open on this. The function of these antibodies and whether or not they impact clinical outcome, whether they enhance um, uh, immunotherapy type of approaches, we actually don't know by and large for most of the naturally occurring autoantibodies that happen in cancer, um, whether they impact clinical outcome. And even within P53, where the data is best known, it is actually quite mixed in terms of uh, are these antibodies associated with improved prognosis, worse prognosis. It really depends on, on who's measuring it and, and uh, how it's been measured and in what disease state and others. Um, so it is actually um, a lot of this is full, is, is not uh, yet known. Um, we have looked at a number of different diseases, and, and a number of these have actually been licensed out as, as potential biomarkers for early detection. Uh, our breast cancer-based autoantibody panels have been licensed to um, out as, uh, were available as um, LDTs and as Vedessa breast and Vedessa ovarian cancer to Provista Diagnostics. Um, um, we have a number of different uh, HPV-specific um, uh, serologic biomarkers that we have identified really by, by changing how we display HPV-driven proteins, and those are now uh, moving on as um, uh, serologic biomarkers for, in particular, for head and neck cancer, for HPV-driven or pharyngeal cancers, and is now the basis of the uh, Houston screening trial at MD Anderson, um, which is a uh, prospective screening study for uh, HPV-driven um, or pharyngeal cancers. Um, whether or not these biomarkers are predictive, um, in particular, of checkpoint response um, and, and whether antibodies can be useful for helping us understand the efficacy of, of uh, especially complex immunotherapies and non-antigen-specific immunotherapies really remains to be seen. Whether they can be informative to help us understand where, where the T-cell responses are actually driven um, also remains to be seen. We do know that antibody responses do correlate with, obviously, with CD4 immunity, but but also um, uh, from older work from Sasha, Sasha Genetic and others um, have shown that it also correlates strongly with CD8-specific responses. So they can be a little bit of a window um, and of opportunity to sort of narrow down your, your antigen discovery, uh, in particular to identify antigens that at least drive um, some amount of CD4, if not CD8, responses as well. This is a little bit of an example of uh, immunoprofiling HPV. This is uh, HPV-specific arrays that we have to a number of, um, this is to, I think, 13 different uh, HPV-driven proteomes for high-risk HPVs. We have uh, uh, also the low-risk HPVs, uh, HPV 6 and, and 11. Um, and what you can see here, this is um, looking at plasma from patients. Uh, in this case, this was... Uh, cervical cancer um, and pre-invasive cervical disease, and you can see these pa different patterns of antibody responses that show up in, in women who have been exposed to different HPV uh, uh, different HPV serotypes and subtypes. And the interesting thing from, from and we've looked now at, at, at thousands of individuals, even in, in head and neck cancer where it's almost entirely HPV 16, the patterns of the antibody responses to a virus that is virtually doesn't mutate, okay, as a double-stranded DNA virus, a very small virus, um, the patterns of the responses in these individuals with head and neck cancer vary. So some individuals will have just E2-specific antibody responses, some will have E6 and E7, some will have pan-antibody responses, and the prognostic significance and the clinical significance and, the, and, and what the source of that viral-specific variation in antibody responses is really um, still unknown. It is probably related in the, ca in the case of HPV, and this relates, I think, back a little bit to the hepatitis lecture that, that we just heard. Um, it relates probably in part to both viral load and also to 
um, viral integration status and the sites of integration in particular on the virus and in the ongoing expression of some of these antigens. But I think that the, the source and the, and the biology of why we end up with different patterns of antibody responses um, to, to this virus in particular in, in head and neck cancer actually remains to be seen. This is a, um, an example of the utility of using, using antibodies and, and patterns of antibodies for breast cancer detection. We had identified a panel of 28 specific autoantibodies uh, for breast cancer that then were licensed out and were combined with a variety of uh, different protein-based biomarkers as well. And so a combination of protein and autoantibody, I will say the autoantibodies tend to provide specificity where the uh, proteins tend to improve sensitivity of, of these analytic um, uh, panels. Um, and uh, so these have been tested in particular for the utility for sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative uh, predictive values, in particular for BIRADS 3 and 4A. Um, so these indeterminate breast uh, nodules uh, for helping uh, do uh, clinical decision making um, in the context of, of breast cancer. And much of this work has been published. Um, um, and the utility of, the, of these biomarker panels really for breast cancer uh, still remain to be um, uh, further developed. But what we've learned from a lot of this, and, and, and we've published some on, on what are the structural bases of, of why some of these um, auto proteins really are, are more immunogenic than others. Certainly what we do know is that if they bind to um, to nucleic acid naturally, obviously, that is uh, much more immunogenic in part probably via um, uh, uh, pattern-based uh, recognition on the part of um, toll-like receptors. But there's also uh, biochemical basis of, of immunogenicity based on intracellular location and function. We find anything involved in, the, in certainly in the apoptotic pathway is highly immunogenic in others. And some of this is also, unfortunately, is also embedded in the biases of our particular system, which tends to prefer and expand on antibodies that are uh, soluble, uh, are, are recognizing soluble and intracellular antigens in part because of the folding issues that I just described. Um, one thing that we do find is specific tumor-associated um, antibodies are generally present in less than 10% of in, in any given individuals. And it's not just based on the mutation process. These, these are, by and large, to non-mutated antigens um, of what we have looked at. And, and why there is that, that specificity, even to uh, proteins that, that are highly mutated in tumors, um, really remains to be seen. But, but when it comes to utility of antibodies and patterns of antibodies and panels of these for biomarkers, either for following patients with cancer or for detection, you actually need sort of uh, many more sort of multi-parametric analyses and, and multiple antibodies for, for any given um, molecular uh, detection systems uh, outside, uh, I would say, of the viral cases, okay? And in that case, for viruses such as HPV, we, we, we can actually measure detection really with only about three or four different proteins uh, to be able to do this. So can we use some of this information then to, to learn about um, T cell profiling? And I want to address some of the um, uh, the questions actually that, that came out a little bit earlier. And I, I, I don't need to educate this particular group on in terms of the challenge of T-cell immunoprofiling. This is, you know, logs more complicated and, and difficult. Um, when you go from candidate protein antigens, especially if you're looking at, 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 at mutagenomes or you're looking at um, just general uh, candidate protein antigens, it could be measured even in the 100,000, depending on uh, what you're looking at. You, you, you can use prediction algorithms to get yourself down from, from some number, limited number of uh, candidate antigens. And for those of us who can't afford a lot of um, pentamers, it, 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 you really need to narrow them down bioinformatically and otherwise um, to go after individual uh, potential epitopes. And, and to understand what are the rules of immunogenicity, how do we prioritize neoepitopes in particular in the cancer field, how do we improve our ability for prediction algorithms to help do this is, is been the focus of a lot of what um, my lab has been working on. So a number of years ago, um, we looked at um, at the biochemistry of amino acid use uh, between what were defined as, as immunogenic and non-immunogenic based self-peptides and, and, and pathogen-specific peptides and what was available at the time from IEDB and, and, and other uh, databases. Uh, we had uh, created a 
sort of a non-overlapping databases of immuno, what were defined as immunogenic and non-immunogenic epitopes. And we provided, we looked at a variety of different biochemical parameters and, and hydrophobicity was one of them. Uh, but of those consistently hydrophobicity of the TCR contact residues, and I would say relative hydrophobicity, certainly came out of, of our uh, particular analysis of more likely to be present in um, immunogenic versus non-immunogenic based peptides. And we went on, um, um, and if you sort of break this down across uh, residue positions, it it the hydrophobicity based uh, components actually in in this biases that we were observing was not present in the anchor residues as you might expect. The anchor residues should be the same whether you're immunogenic or you're not immunogenic. And we what we really found was the biases really occur. Um, in this case, in HLA2, around uh, P4 and around P7, P8, where you're starting to see much more significant differences. And I want to point out that they're not hydrophobic. It's relatively hydrophobic. These are actually hydrophilic residues by and large, but it is a relative amount of hydrophobicity uh, that we found consistently. And this was true in, in murine alleles. This was true across um, a broader uh, set of HLA-specific alleles, human alleles as well, those for which we actually had significant uh, at least sufficient data to be able to analyze them, um, I will say some of the minor ones. And, and based on this, we had initially Diego Chow, who was a graduate student in my group, who's now currently at Sloan Kettering, um, had looked at um, developing an um, artificial neural network uh, prediction model. I will say that we've moved on from this really to um, uh, to secondary structures, but but we were calculating, trying to calculate what is the probability that a given epitope uh, it would be more likely to engender a, um, a T cell receptor based response, and we have used this then to validate it in vivo uh, using a murine system uh, of HIV based uh, gag epitope vaccination that Joe Blattman and uh, um, had been uh, already been doing in at our institute and looking at particular ones. So, so we can improve on the prediction ability of what would be immunogenic versus what was not, just simply based on the relative hydrophobicity of TCR contact residues. So that in, wasn't particularly um, striking. But what was interesting is in the, in the limited data that, that we could find in the literature of predicting the relative immunogenicity, we could actually assign an immunogenicity score based on the, the relative skewing of, of the biochemical parameters and it seemed to correlate, at least in, in a, a few limited systems at the time, of, um, of the relative amounts of immunogenicity that, that could be induced in, at least in vitro and or in vivo. And so based on that, we actually had developed an epitope prediction pipeline. Uh, that pipeline, one of the challenges we had at the time was that um, you know, there are many different prediction algorithms, um, and and they vary, really, in, in the, the, the efficiency of prediction. And for those of us who are, you know, who have limited time and effort to be able to, to run a lot of peptides through through a lot of systems, we were, we were trying to normalize across these different algorithms. So we actually used both a uh, combination of antigen processing and HLA binding algorithms. We actually normalize across a number of these. We use these for predicting uh, epitopes from HPV-16 um, and using these normalized scores and then in, in, in embedding our immunogenicity uh, prediction systems, we identified a number of novel epitopes from HPV-16. Uh, which are published across a number of different HLAs and, and then went on to validate those in vitro. This is some LA spot data that um, uh, uh, Krishna Ramachandran, who is now, uh, sorry, uh, Sri Krishna, who is now actually at the NCI uh, doing his postdoctoral fellowship, had, had mapped out um, a number of different novel epitopes from HPV-16, in particular E2 uh, protein uh, that are now f moving their f way forward in clinical development. We've also applied this to Cas9. Uh, we, uh, many people in the field of uh, of uh, gene therapy, are worried about the in, the the pre-existing immunity that may be present to the Cas9 protein, which is obviously derived from bacteria and is derived from a common bacteria. And so we looked, and 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 predicted a number of different potential epitopes from the Cas9 protein. It's fairly large bacteria, and what you find is that that if you look. Um, 
a combination not just of HLA binding, but also from, from probability of immunogenicity. And is, so if you select peptides in this quadrant, so, so both a, the enhanced immunogenicity score, you can improve on the efficiency of prediction by about between 30 and 50 percent. It's not perfect, but it certainly improves on, on, on the efficiency. So we identified a, a couple of uh, strong A2 binding pep peptides, I apologize, and then, um, and then predicted um, uh, we predict those peptides actually identified a number of them um, pre-existing in, in the blood of healthy people and then went on to, to sort of do a reverse heteroclitic um, engineering where you knock out the, the um, binding residues at, at, at P2 and P9, um, alter them without altering Cas9 structure, and so you can actually eliminate the immunogenicity, at least for the immunodominant epitopes, uh, the two immunodominant epitopes that we identified in Cas9, and whether or not that actually will ultimately be uh, be be useful for a very large bacterial protein, or, or whether or not you're going to actually start bringing out subdominant epitopes um, on on repetitive exposure remains to be seen. But I think the 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 issues of of sort of making making proteins less immunogenic rather than more immunogenic is the flip side of what a lot of us are looking at. So um, I think that, that we know that tumors express, obviously, tumor-specific proteomes. I think our understanding of those proteomes um, is, a, is, is a moving target, and our uh, ability to sort of to, to measure and, and, and to look at, in particular, the immunogenicity of these um, remains to be seen. And I think one of the challenges when we look at, at, at tumor-specific proteomes is you are looking for the needle in the haystack. And, and you have these immunologically irrelevant peptides. You have these tumor-specific epitopes, obviously, that the T-cell receptors are seeing. And, and, and all of our work has really been focused on the MHC class one landscape. And if you look at these cancer-derived epitopes, you know, when you look at their, their sequences and, and what drives some of them to be more immunogenic than others, I, I think we really still are, are, are scratching the surface of this and the depth of this expression. And what we've learned and what you've seen is that there is a very low neoepitope identification rate um, um, out of the neoepitopes that, that, that can be predicted. So we need better systems to be able to predict those that might be immunogenic. Um, and so one of the approaches that we've done, we, we have created, a, a, as, as many have, um, a computational algorithms for improving uh, uh, biochemical prediction and, and have wrapped in some of our immunogenicity uh, prediction systems, and this is up on GitHub for anyone who's interested, um, for identifying neoepitopes. Uh, and, and trying to help prioritize these, these neoantigens. Um, but what, we've, what we're learning is that mutations are only, uh, you know, part of the system. Claude Perot and others have identified these, these atypical translation events that may be actually contributing significantly to the neoepitope landscape in, in cancers. And I think that, that what we need, we do need improved pipelines and, and structure-based pipelines to help us understand what might be immunogenic in, in these individuals. So what we've been working on is, is really two different uh, approaches to this. So one is, is we've been working on some immunopeptidome discovery systems um, and doing some data-independent uh, mass spec-based analyses and improve, trying to improve some of the data-independent acquisition workflows. Um, and as and what um, Eric Wilson in my lab recently presented at the mass spec meeting in, in the West Coast has been working on a pom computational pipeline for the identification of MHC1 peptides from mass spec, from, in particular from DIA data. And, and so he's, um, this should be out on GitHub within the next uh, month or so. It's called MHC Treasure Hunt. Um, and it takes both DIA and DDA mass spec data, um, runs it through various decoy generation and, and rescoring, and then sort of builds it through what it, what would be predicted and and then what falls out from this. And this, and and one reassuring thing is at least when we're working with data sets that already exist, is that we are ending up with with um, with epitopes that do agree with what would be predicted um, in terms of uh, binding characteristics and, and amino acid biases. So, so I, I think that we need sort of easier, better ways to be able to analyze this data um, um, in a rapid way to be able to identify some of these neoepitopes. So, so that's been part of what we've been doing. And I will say that the, the second part, and we have been working 
with um, Avi Singeroy, who is a uh, new faculty member at ASU, who does a lot of molecular dynamic modeling at the high resolution scale. And so we've been working on modeling MHC peptide interactions um, based on uh, current existing um, uh, uh, crystal structures, of which there are about 400, and, um, and using that really to model out across a number of different HLA molecules, in particular peptide MHC, and I will say it's just strictly for class one right now, uh, try to, trying to create an in silico workflow to, to characterize a much broader set of, um, of MHC molecules, with the ultimate goal really to help develop computational systems for predicting TCR, and I think that is where our work will be going certainly for the next five years. And so I, I just want to say that, you know, we continue to learn a lot in particular about long-term responders um, from checkpoint blockade and complex immunotherapies. I think that the, the proteomic and the peptidomic data is really necessary for us to improve these prediction systems, not just for peptide binding, but peptide stability. Um, and, and TCR contact as we understand what really drives immunogenicity and, and to help us improve the efficiency of immunotherapies. And with that, I just want to acknowledge the many people in my lab, in particular Eric Wilson, who has done a lot of our uh, structure work, and Avi Singeroy, my collaborator at ASU. Thank you.